Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series on the synthesis of yoga. We are in the chapter Self-Surrender in Works, the way of the Gita. And we begin with the line, for it is certain that so great a result with our beloved Ranga. So we have to read today, for it is certain that so great a result. He has been speaking about the samatha equality and he has given us many interesting cases where it is not equality but it seems to be equality. Equality of pride, equality of disappointedness. Okay, when you are disappointed in something, you console yourself saying, oh, it doesn't make any difference to me. So, all the very interesting cases. So, the vital has a habit of fooling. You fooling you all the time. Your own vital is fooling you. <laughs> okay. So, and also one... trying to take over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ego, attachment and desire. All yes. these have to be given up for the self-surrender to the divine. So, I'll do one thing. I'll read out the summary of what he said earlier. Mm -hmm. Then we get the sense of continuity. Good. So, in the earlier paragraph he has said, the capacity of the vital in man to deceive the person is very great indeed. There are certain states of being which ape desirelessness, but these are illusions or at least semblances. These are, the first one, equality of disappointed resignation. So we have the example of the fox and the uh, sour grapes. He can't get them, so he consoles himself by saying, oh, they must be sour. So when you fail to get something, then you say, oh, it doesn't make any difference to me. Actually, you are hurt. Okay. They recently, one of the students was telling me the example of this. One boy was very confident and he was expecting to be first in one of the exams. But it so turned out that he came out second and he could get the first prize. So he started saying, it doesn't make any difference to me. But he is hurt somewhere, they could see. Okay. So that's what Sunday is saying. The equality of disappointed resignation, the fox and the sour grapes example. Then the second one, there is also an equality of hardness. You are very hard and you are not, it's not the real equality. Equality is a positive state. This equality of hardness is you I'm not say, going to be moved. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if someone is insensitive, mm. okay, even if you insult him, he may not react. But that is not equality. That is insensitivity. He doesn't know what's happening. He is uh, no reaction at all. Inertia is the character of the person. Then there is the equality of hardness, insensitivity, indifference in a pejorative sense. Then there is the equality of pride also. <laughs> All these states are basically egoistic and must be definitely removed because they do come up in the course of sadhana. Sri so is making a very clear statement that they do come up. He gives his own example in the Uttarpada speech. Mm -hmm. As I told you, I, am, I was fighting for India's freedom. I am not doing anything for myself. I am doing it for the nation. But then he was taken away and put into prison by Sri Krishna. And he was saying, why has this? The, why has the divine done this to me? I was doing a wonderful work. Then later on he realized that there was an ambition lurking in the background. <laughs> a personal ambition. Yes, you are working for something else. But there is an ambition inside a sort of self-satisfaction. I am doing good work. That sort of subtle ego. Not very subtle either. <laughs> mm, we hear it all the time. I am working for the Divine Mother. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the one. And simply saying, they do come up in the course of the sadhana. Then, but, a more but in a more positive sense, there are 
partial states of equality also more positive not so negative and he is given examples there is a stoic equality an attempt to remain unaffected stoicism the attempt to remain calm and quiet it's only an attempt you may not be calm and quiet but it's a positive thing but it's not the real samatha it's not the real equality then there is a devotional acceptance of god's will that also is not samatha okay god has seen fit to give me this suffering okay i have lost my best friend i have lost my parents but i accept god's will i am you don't admit to yourself that you are hurt but you accept god's will so that also is not equality it's an attempt to go it's it's good but it's not the real equality equality is that which is absolutely you're not affected in the least you are absolutely calm and quiet then there is a devotional acceptance of god's will third one there is also a wise detachment that understands the necessity to remain unaffected by life's difficulties and failures you are a very intelligent person and you realize that if you are attached to something or there is ego there will be suffering so you convince yourself to dissociate yourself from ego and desire and attachment that's also good but it's not the real it's a it's a step towards the real equality then there is also the soul's distancing itself from external events and standing aloof instead of facing the problems of the world you run away to the forest or the cave where you are not facing the problems so you are not disturbed so is that equality no because you have run away from the problems <laughs> that's what he is saying the distancing yourself from the events of the physical world then but all these however good they may be are not the real equality though they may be primary initial steps to the real samatvam you can say samatvam you can also say samata okay equality <coughs> equality of the soul Having said that, we will now read the paragraph that we have to read today. For it is certain that so great a result cannot be arrived at immediately and without any previous stages. At first, we have to learn to bear the shocks of the world with the central part of our being untouched and silent, even when the surface mind, heart. and life are strongly shaken unmoved there on the bedrock of our life we must separate the soul watching behind or immune deep within from these outer workings of our nature afterwards extending this calm and steadfastness of the detached soul to its instruments it will become slowly possible to radiate peace from the luminous center to the darker peripheries in this process we may take the passing help of many minor phases a certain stoicism a certain calm philosophy a certain religious exaltation may help may help us towards some nearness to our aim or we may call in even less strong and exalted but still useful powers of our mental nature in the end we must either discard or transform them and arrive instead at an entire equality a perfect self existent peace within and even if we can a total unassailable self poise and spontaneous delight in all our members so he is saying that there are many steps it cannot be done easily in fact desire is very very difficult to get rid of and so so long as desire is there an equality cannot be there <clears throat> and ego also is there you cannot but you can make an attempt all attempt is good but finally you have to get rid of all these things ego attachment desire and lean more on the soul 
So we'll read each sentence and see whether it's clear. So the first one is very easy. For it is certain that so great a result cannot be arrived at immediately and without any previous stages. So it's a definitely a graded effort. In the beginning, you make an effort, then slowly, slowly, the results start coming in. But your effort is going on, and finally, you reach the goal, and then the effort stops because you have reached the goal. But there is a period where the both your effort and the results coming in are both there. This you can see in yourself that things which disturbed you earlier are not disturbing you so much now. You it seems to be less, but still there is something. And this distancing yourself from the events of the physical world or your own reactions can be twofold. He is saying there is an inner being which is disturbed, and there is the outer manifestation in the body mind life. Okay, a yogi very often has achieved a samata within, but not yet without. So he may continue to show. Movements of anger. He may continue to show movements of attachment. Okay, but inside he is absolutely pure and calm. So that is the first step. So they are saying the inner must change first, and then the outer. That inner peace you can extend it to your body mind life. But the body mind life cannot be fully changed unless you go to the super mental world. So all yogi, all yogis. Why yogis, even avatars? There will be defects in the outer nature. Avatars at present, even they will have defects in the outer nature. That's interesting. You must know that it's only in the super mental race that even defects in the outer nature will not be there. But the inner being is absolutely in a perfect divine condition. <laughs> the body mind life is very difficult to change he is telling you that so great a result cannot be arrived at immediately and without any previous stages so there are grades you make an effort 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 and then slowly the results start coming in but you don't stop you go on until you feel that yes 80% is done and yet there's the falling back constantly uh, that also can happen because your old nature is pulling you back mm -hmm. all the time the past has always an effect in the present and even in the future that's the law of karma whatever you have done okay that's why it has to be gradual slowly slowly you have to break with the old habits and introduce a new okay so <clears throat> at first we have to learn to bear the shocks of the world with the central part of our being untouched and silent so which is the central part so the office speaks of the central being he means by that the inner psychic being or also the self the he witness the witness self yes okay that's the central part the rest is all accidental parts or if you want instrumental parts your body your mind and your life have been constructed by nature and they will also dissolve after death okay so they are not the central part the central part is a true being which the psychic being is evolving but the self does not evolve it's always the same so this is the central part okay the central part of our being so but he is using a singular he is saying central part because although they seem to be two different things they can join and become one if you have the experience of the psychic being first it can join itself to the self <clears throat> or if you have the experience of the self first okay the psychic being can also come in later or it may not many of the um yogis are very satisfied with the peace and the freedom and the sense of infinity and immortality of the self they are not interested in any emotion they are more than satisfied with that okay so that is also possible but many of them they have both okay ramakrishna it was very obvious that he had both and uh, even uh, raman maharshi yeah he was a he was a he was known as a gyani he is the one who had the self first but afterwards when 
Sometimes slokas and bhajans were being sung. There used to be tears in his eyes. Emotion was there. <laughs> so, so central part of the being untouched and silent. Even when the surface mind, heart, and life. Okay. Now he is making a difference between heart and life. Heart is the higher vital, and life is the lower vital. <clears throat> the higher vital, the heart has got. Very noble emotions, okay, self selflessness, generosity, um, uh, admiration for beautiful things, even uh, patriotism, respect for everybody, love of everybody. All these are the higher vital. The lower vital is more dynamic, but more impure. all the emotions which are very normal in man anger jealousy pettiness selfishness miserliness all these things belong to the lower vital it's natural but it's got this tremendous amount of energy there in the vital so if you purify it it becomes a tremendous help to you this is something that is often not understood and even those who worship hanuman okay there uh, many people think that this is stupid why should you worship uh, a monkey okay in fact there is a lot of ignorance about those also who do worship but hanuman is the symbol of the psychicized vital when the psychic comes forward it purifies the vital so how is it the symbol of a psychicized vital because when he opens his chest okay he is offered there is an interesting story about him he is offered very valuable um mementos or whatever you call it something which would remind him of ram and sita and he refuses he says no i don't need these so everybody is shocked this fellow is he is a devotee of ram and sita and he is refusing these things which will remind him then he says i don't need reminders and he opens his chest and there is ram and sita seated in his heart so this is the symbol clear symbol of devotion okay man how is it question of the vital because he can do unbelievable deeds he can fly in the air he can lift up a a whole mountain with his finger and he can do all these things he can increase his size decrease his size so he is the symbol of the psychicized vital and that's why he is worshiped but those who worship have forgotten the symbolism <laughs> and the the same thing also with the in india the um, worship of rats <laughs> people will say this is stupid okay and in a way it is stupid but it is symbolic the rat is the vahana of of ganpati okay ganpati is the ganesh he is the destroyer of obstacles and he is the that's right vigneshwara he is the destroyer what so it is expressed in this way <laughs> okay you forget the real significance and you start worshiping all this <laughs> so anyway so this is the i went into that because of the central part he is talking of the central part life remain strongly shaken unmoved there on the bedrock of our life we must separate the soul watching behind or immune deep within from these outer workings of our nature so sen is using two words here watching behind or immune deep within so sen do often uses the word behind to indicate the self but in our way of thinking the self is not behind but above but sri vindu often uses the word behind because maybe you experience it in that way okay you are behind and watching but it's a little above above because when you experience the self your consciousness is not in the body mind life it has gone up it has gone out okay so <clears throat> and actually this up and down is meaningless that's why he uses the word maybe behind say what is up for us if you are standing on the south pole 
and you are standing on the north pole what is up for you is down for the other man there is no meaning in it okay so what is left and right also has no meaning so this is our way of seeing and thinking but actually in the spiritual world there is no up and down they are all involved with each other <laughs> so that's why maybe same thing is the word behind okay so afterwards extending this calm and steadfastness of the detached soul to its instruments what are the instruments body life and mind it will become slowly possible to radiate peace from the luminous center to the darker peripheries the luminous center is your psychic being or the self and it slowly it allows the light which is strong within to influence body vital and mind <laughs> that's what he's saying he's using beautiful words radiate peace from the luminous center to the darker peripheries the darker peripheries are your body mind life <laughs> okay so in this process we may take the passing help of many minor phases a certain stoicism a certain calm philosophy he has spoken of them earlier also stoicism the teaching yourself not to be affected neither by sorrow nor by pleasure nothing to remain absolutely calm and quiet a certain calm philosophy a certain religious exaltation may help us towards some nearness to our aim see he is here he is talking of stoicism certain calm philosophical attitude and a certain religious exaltation he is repeating what he has said earlier certain religious exaltation accepting the will of god okay and calm philosophy you convince yourself that you should not be able to with the mind and the stoicism we are vital you are teaching your vital to remain not disturbed by events in the physical world but it is a passing help he says yes because they are not the real mm. uh, samatha they are steps towards the real equality so or we may call in even less strong and exalted but still useful powers of our mental nature you can use your mind because your mind is the best part of the instrumental being your body and your vital are more difficult to manage but with the mind you can slowly convince yourself and use your mind to achieve this equality <laughs> you can use your mind okay so in the end we must either discard or transform them transform what these things that he has spoken about stoicism certain calm philosophy and certain religious exaltation transform them and arrive instead at an entire equality no not even an iota anywhere of any disturbance a perfect self existent peace within and even if we, and even if we can a total unassailable self poise and spontaneous delight in all our members so the first step is not to be affected you are calm and peaceful neither the enjoyment is affecting you nor the mm, uh, wrong uh, influences or the negative influences are affecting you neither sorrow nor pleasure but shrevi is saying if you can it's interesting start enjoying everything yeah <laughs> those things which you did not like earlier even that you must learn to enjoy that is the last stage <laughs> i usually give my own example of not liking bitter taste <laughs> okay but if i manage one day to get the samata what he is speaking about i will start enjoying that also <laughs> he goes so far as to say you can even enjoy failure if you fail somewhere there is only enjoyment nothing else it sounds very peculiar because enjoying failure sounds almost perverse 
but there is a spiritual condition where that is possible <laughs> i must be very happy then <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to do it <laughs> so total unassailable self poise spontaneous delight spontaneous delight mm. it is not caused by anything in the physical world success and these things praise they give you delight but this spontaneous delight no cause it is generated within yourself self delight self poise and self delight we go to the next para but how then shall we continue to act at all because if you are not initiating any action and you are absolutely calm and quiet for everything how are you going to act <laughs> for ordinarily the human being acts because he has a desire or feels a mental vital or physical want or need he is driven by the necessities of the body by the lust of riches honors or fame or by craving for the personal satisfactions of the mind or the heart or a craving for power or pleasure or he is seized and pushed about by moral need or at least the need or the desire of making his ideas or his ideals or his will or his party or his country or his gods prevail in the world very interesting we'll look at each case if none of these desires nor any other must be the spring of our action it would seem as if all incentive or motive power had been removed and action itself must necessarily cease the gita replies with its third great secret of the divine life all action must be done in a more and more godward and finally a god possessed consciousness our works must be a sacrifice to the divine and in the end a surrender of all our being mind will heart sense life and body to the one must make god love and god service our only motive no other motive but this the transformation of the motive force and very character of works is indeed its master idea <clears throat> it is the its master idea he is talking of gita okay so it is the foundation of its unique synthesis of works love and knowledge in the end not desire but the consciously felt will of the eternal remains as the sole driver of our action and the sole originator of its initiative so very very difficult to achieve this how far it goes we will see now okay so so normally it's true that when you act there is a thought in the mind it's originated in the thought i have to do this such a simple thing as even going for a even the most uh, ordinary things okay you have to buy something from the market you your pen is broken you need a pen so there is an initiation in the mind first i need a pen it comes in the thought so all initiation of action gita says must be suspended you must depend entirely on the divine that's obviously not easy if i if my soap is finished i have to go and buy a soap but if you are in that condition the soap will come by itself because you are depending entirely on him he will provide you with whatever you need sounds very funny but that can happen if your surrender is 100% otherwise a little bit of initiation is always there but very often even when you are not fully realized what you need comes by itself because you are in a concentrated condition <laughs> it happens <laughs> sometimes surprisingly accurate i have heard of cases where they require a certain sum for something 
and the exact amount comes to you <laughs> that also can happen not more not less <laughs> so so how shall so this desire has to be cut that's why the uh, initiation of action has to be suspended in the mind not easy obviously <laughs> not easy <laughs> if you are given a work yeah and you have to do that work, yeah that's right <laughs> then you have to try to there is a phase na you in the beginning you mm-hmm. must be conscious that you are doing with your own will and not the divine will even that's a huge step okay yes yes i am doing it because i feel a need but guide me and make me conscious of your will so that i don't use my will but i am more obedient to your will at present i am not seeing your will but please make that possible that prayer is there slowly things change <laughs> first is to become conscious that you are doing out of your own need and desire it can be a need or it can be a desire a desire is not a need but a need is something that you need you need clothes you need shoes even shoes you don't need <laughs> but you need clothes okay so these are the things that you need but there is a different between need and desire Hmm. But the moment you start saying, "I want this type of clothes and not that," that's the desire again. So, very, very subtle and very difficult to do. Yes. <laughs> But that's what the Gita is saying you should do. <clears throat> the, the Gita is very clear: Sarva Ramba Parityaga. The initiation of everything in the mind has to be cut. Total dependence on the divine. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what Sri Mukti is saying. so how then shall we continue to act at all for ordinarily the human being acts because he has a desire or feels a mental vital or physical want or need okay want and need also need not be a desire it can be very mild desire okay so he is driven by the necessities of the body okay by the lust of riches honors or fame or by craving for the personal satisfactions of the mind or the heart or a craving for power or pleasure so he is giving you a whole gradation okay <clears throat> or he is seized and pushed about by a moral need or at least the need or the desire of making his ideas or his ideals or his will or his party or his country or his gods prevail in the world so so you feel that you are not doing it for yourself you are doing it for the country you are doing it for god okay so, so the proselytizing of the christians they are doing it for god they are helping god spreading his name and fame okay so is then or you may feel you are doing it for your family or you are doing it for your country that should have been sort of no so he was fighting for the independence movement okay so, so it is so subtle <clears throat> if none of these desires nor any other must be the spring of our action it would seem as if all in his incentive or motive power had been removed and action itself must necessarily cease See, if i have no desire i will not be pushed to act if i have no motive i will not be pushed to act that's obvious <clears throat> okay so the gita replies with the third great secret of the divine life all action must be done in a more and more godward and finally a god possessed consciousness do it for the lord and not for yourself nishkama karma mm-hmm. desireless action so there also first of all it is god word movement god word work finally god possessed consciousness god possesses you and he is driving you about like a puppet and it's a very very happy condition <laughs> normally the teaching in many parts for instance in the europeans they value their own will and their sense of independence that's good at the physical level it's very good not for a spiritual life for a spiritual life it becomes ego and you have to get rid of the ego individuality stressing your own 
yourself is very good in the physical world it achieves a lot of things which you would not have achieved otherwise but for a spiritual life suspension of all these things <laughs> god possesses consciousness our works must be a sacrifice to the divine and in the end a surrender of all our being and look at the description what is your being mind will heart sense life and body to the one must make god love and god service our only motive <laughs> yes told you right in the beginning it's not easy So now he is telling you how difficult it is. <laughs> This transformation of the motive force and the very character of works is indeed its master idea, the Gita's idea. It is the foundation of its unique synthesis of works, love, and knowledge, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga. In the end, not desire. but the consciously felt will of the divine of the eternal remains as the sole driver of our action and the sole originator of its initiative we had on page 102 yeah the statement therefore the first rule of action laid down by the gita is to do the work that should be done without any desire for the fruit that, nishkama karma yeah that's right So he's saying the same thing in the end, yeah, slightly yeah. different words. Mm-hmm. So there's a small paragraph which completes the chapter. So we can finish that today. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> Equality, renunciation of all desire for the fruit of our works, action done as a sacrifice to the supreme Lord of our nature and all nature. of all nature these are the three first godward approaches in the gita's way of karma yoga <coughs> shravda accepts the concept of the karma yoga of the, in the gita fully okay so equality samata renunciation of all desire for the fruit of the works nishkama karma and action done as a sacrifice to the supreme lord yajya whatever you are doing you do it as an offering to the divine so this is the gita's karma yoga suspension of all desire of all desire for the fruit of the action equality and surrender <laughs> these are the three things so he continues now in the next chap in the next chapter with the concept of the sacrifice and the triune path and the lord of the sacrifice the triune path is the bhakti yoga karma yoga gnana yoga <laughs> the pursuit of knowledge the pursuit of love for the divine and the pursuit of offering all your actions to the divine <laughs> that's the next chapter so chapter 4 the sacrifice the triune path and the lord of the sacrifice <laughs> now the first paragraph is very interesting and he explains the concept of sacrifice it's a little um, complex and he has put it very shortly but he's taking it from the gita what exactly is meant by the sacrifice yajna the law of sacrifice is the common divine action that was thrown out into the world in its beginning as a symbol of the solidarity of the universe it is by the attraction of this law that a divinizing principle a saving power descends to limit and correct and gradually to eliminate the errors of an egoistic and self divided creation this descent this sacrifice of the purusha the divine soul submitting itself to force and matter so that it may inform and illuminate them is a seed 
of the redemption of this world of inconscience and ignorance for with sacrifice as their companion says the gita the all father created these peoples the acceptance of the law of sacrifice is a practical recognition by the ego that it is neither alone in the world nor chief in the world it is its admission that even in this much fragmented existence there is beyond itself and behind that and behind beyond itself and behind that which is not its own egoistic person something greater and completer a diviner all which demands from it subordination and service indeed sacrifice is imposed and where need be compelled by the universal world force it takes it even from those who do not consciously recognize the law inevitably because this is the intrinsic nature of things our ignorance or our false egoistic view of life can make no difference to this eternal bedrock truth of nature for this is the truth in nature that this ego which thinks itself a separate independent being and claims to live for itself is not and cannot be independent nor separate nor can it live to itself even if it would but rather all are linked together by a secret oneness each existence is continually giving out per force from its stock out of its mental receipts from nature or its vital and physical assets and acquisitions and belongings a stream goes to all that is around it and always again it receives something from its environment gratis or in return for its voluntary or involuntary tribute for it is only by this giving and receiving that it can affect its own growth while at the same time it helps the sum of things at length though at first slowly and partially we learn to make the conscious sacrifice even in the end we take joy to give ourselves and what we envisage as belonging to us in a spirit of love and devotion to that which appears for the moment other than ourselves and is certainly other than our limited personalities the sacrifice and the divine return for our sacrifice then become a gladly accepted means towards our last perfection for it is recognized now as a road to the fulfillment in us of the eternal purpose so it's a very involved uh, paragraph and lot of ideas are involved in it we'll have to discuss that in detail it may take even one full session what exactly is meant by sacrifice very briefly we can touch upon it when the divine is creating the world the principle of the one becoming the many comes up we must remember these few things which are coming all the time the one becomes the many the formless becomes form the static the permanent becomes the dynamic and the transient here okay so these things and the gradation the purest seems to become more and more polluted and at the lower level the purity is gone <laughs> so these are the things and there is a gradation the subtlest and the grossest so these things if you remember then the principle here being discussed is the one becoming the many so are these many totally separate that's what man thinks i am separate from you you are separate from her but they are all connected that's see and there is a constant interchange conscious or unconscious we can start first of all with the universe the individual needs the universe the food comes to him from the universe 
the oxygen comes to him from the universe he needs the universe so he is connected very much with the universe he is not separate from the universe this is the first thing secondly also i am putting it in a very gross manner but this is a subtle and subtle truth you need your doctor you need your tailor you need your lawyer you need your teacher you need your parents <laughs> so you are all connected but this connection is at the spiritual level very very strong and a great reality but here we have lost that thing and we feel that we are all separate so selfishness and self centeredness comes in so the law of sacrifice comes down from on top and tries to correct this that's what some they say <clears throat> and the correct the connectedness can also uh, be expressed in many ways i'll just give you one sanskrit shloka but i'll translate it to english okay it says that the river is flowing not for its own use it is flowing for the use of others it has no use for itself okay the cow is giving milk not for itself but for the others the trees are bearing fruit not for itself but for the others so the last phrase says that your body also should be for the benefit of others and not for yourself <laughs> so that's the law of the sacrifice it is something fundamental in nature which you have to apply to yourself <laughs> then the ego will slowly disappear <laughs> we will discuss this in detail next time <laughs> thank you ranga namaste you all